Welcome, everyone. Uh, now that Greg and some others have got things rolling with some conversation, I think it's probably time for me to officially begin this international conference that we've titled uh, Open and Relational Theology, Its uh, Social and Political Implications. I'm going to try to mute you all while uh, we have folks speaking. I'm, I'm sure that'll uh, there'll be s s hiccups here and there, but because we plan to have about 150 people involved here, uh, it's going to be difficult for everyone to have their their uh, microphones going at once. I want to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Center for Islamic Theology and the Center for Open and Relational Theology. In case you haven't been, I haven't mentioned it, I'm Thomas J. Ord, and I am one of the co-hosts of this uh, international online event. We expect the next three hours, in fact, the next two A's, three hours each day, to be filled with uh, insights, questions, explorations, as we explore the biggest questions of our day, not only uh, questions that are asked in society and in our world, but also theologically and uh, in terms of religion. We've brought together an absolutely amazing uh, set of scholars to make presentations and responses, scholars from both Christian and Muslim traditions. And um, I'm happy to uh, to be a part of this thing. As I was talking with uh, one of my friends uh, yesterday, he said, I can't believe all these people have come together. And I said, that's the power of, you know, technology. And, and we're going to be a part of these things, even though we're all over the world, literally. Manuel Schmidt uh, put together a statement that kind of gives the focus of this particular event. And uh, in that statement, he noted that um, today there is a, a special focus on the role of relationality. We hear uh, scientists talking about the importance of relationships, uh, physicians uh, in social sciences and in politics, in religion. And uh, open and relational theology even talks about what relationality means in terms of God being related, giving and receiving. And in Manuel's uh, sort of introductory explanation of what kinds of things we would be exploring, he noted that uh, process theology, especially the work of Alfred North Whitehead and Charles Hartshorn, has been talking about relationality for quite a while. And in fact, not only been mentioning how things are interrelated and interconnected, but uh, also uh, providing sophisticated conceptual frameworks to talk about that, not just drawing from the sciences and philosophy, but also drawing from the world's great religions, and in particular, the scriptures of uh, those in the theistic traditions. Manuel also points to an emergence uh, in recent times among Muslims uh, upon emphasis upon freedom, uh, individual freedom, freedom of communities, political freedom, and the implications that uh, freedom has for thinking about uh, theology and thinking about the, the way we live in our world. And finally, Manuel mentions a movement that is especially connected to ev uh, the American scene, in fact, the evangelical scene, called open theism. Uh, open theism portrays God as relational, but also moving through time into an open and yet-to-be-determined future. Uh, the Perhaps the most controversial claim is that God cannot know with absolute certainty everything that's going to happen in the future, because there is no future at, at present. It's just a realm of possibilities. So bringing together process thinkers, Muslims of various kinds of theological commitments, but as part of Islam, open theists, and then, you, as you'll find out in the, ne in the next few hours, there are people who kind of straddle these boundaries and move here and there and, and don't fit nicely under any particular label, um, coming all together to explore these big, meaningful, important questions related to, um, to, to social and political um, concerns. Um, as Manuel was writing his particular um, introduction to the conference, he asked three questions that we might explore together. And I thought I'd read those three questions for us. He asked first, 
what does an open or process or relational theology bear out in a time of climate crisis, of pandemics, of war, of other emergencies? Secondly, he says, where are the peace-promoting or the democracy-building potentials of this open and relational theology? And where might its dangers lie? And third, what are the connections between theology and more narrowly, says Manuel, the image of God, and this political and social engagement that we want to explore together? Now, those three questions are just the tip of the iceberg. That does not in any way limit our conversations or limit the lectures and respondents in the next few days. But that gives you a, a bit of a framework of where we would like to go and these big, important questions. I mentioned, oh, I should say, not only, of course, are we talking about this particular kind of theological perspective and these huge political and social implications, but we're doing something radical and important, bringing together the two largest faith communities in the world, Islam and Christianity, and scholars that represent each for what we believe can be a very fruitful conversation. At the start, I mentioned that this particular conference is co-sponsored by uh, the Center for uh, Islam Theology or Muslim Theology in Munster and also the Center for Open and Relational Thought. I thought I'd take a moment and uh, allow the director for the uh, the Center for uh, uh, Muslim Theology, um, Mohanad Korshid, to talk a little bit about what he does at the center and some of the emphases before then uh, talking a bit with Manuel uh, Schmidt. So, um, Mohammed, are you able to to uh, do you have the microphone going? <laughs> yeah, thank thank you, thank you, Tom. Uh, unfortunately, I am here in Berlin uh, on another confer conference, but uh, my internet is not the best. But I hope you are uh, hearing me. So, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, on behalf of the Center for Islamic Theology and the Cluster of Excellence, Religion and Politics, and the, uh, at the University of Münster. I would like to welcome you all to our joint conference with the Center for Open and Relational Theology. It's a particular importance and also a joy that we are trying to answer our questions together from an Islamic and a Christian perspective. I'm extremely grateful that Tom has agreed to engage in this professional dialogue. So thank you, uh, Tom, making this your uh, uh, real. Um, in my brief introductory uh, remarks, I, I want to, to go inside the, 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 uh, our, our uh, questions, and later I will tell you something about uh, uh, our center. Uh, I, but I don't want to anticipate any of the discussions of today and tomorrow, but I would like to share a few thoughts with you from an Islamic perspective. The starting point of open theology, um, as, as I understand it, is the idea that God-human relationship is a relationship of freedom. In his book, The Problem of Freedom, the Egyptian uh, philosopher, uh, philosopher uh, Zakaria Ibrahim, he died 1976, asks several questions which could lead us in our theological reflection. Ibrahim asks, what hinders us to accept that God himself wanted that free entities exist? entities which are equipped with a free will, a will not dependent upon the divine will. Why can we not say that precisely because it's impossible that things exist which are opposite to the divine will, God would be able to create an entity which is absolutely free? Ibrahim continues further, in fact, such autonomous power which is enable, uh, enabled to emerge through God's free will, through the gift which allows a will beside of the divine omnipotence of perfection. Uh, 
But could we not say that the absolute omnipotence of God would even become more clear in the sense that he creates powerful entities instead of incapable beings, which have no power nor a free will? And why don't we say that the more God grants autonomous power to his creation, the more clearer his omnipotence appears? Because the magnitude of the gift given points to the magnitude of the giver of the gift. Is our own freedom not the most honest evidence for God's absolute omnipotence? So, Zachariah Ibrahim. God means absolute freedom. To think of him as such points to creation a self-perpetuating task. If the goal of creation is to find freely devout co-lovers, the Quran says, he, God, uh, God will bring a people he loves and who, and who will love him, Surah 5, verse 54, then one could easily say that the ultimate goal of creation is the realization of freedom. Only the affirmation of freedom is freedom. Therefore, God is freedom. God's original will is a will for openness and thereby for freedom. Mankind is a medium to realize God's love and mercy by voluntary acting. God and mankind are co-workers to realize both. The completeness of a human being is correlated to God's working through him. God's plans are more realized by the personal increasing to fulfill, uh, fulfill God's will. Divine intentions become real if persons are ready to act in a way of love. The value of this model is that there is a proportional in, uh, in, uh, 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 increase of divine and human freedom in their Immanent acting. Mankind is the partner of God in Quranic dictum, Khalif or Khalif, surrogate or substitute. It's the surrogate partner of God who actualizes the divine intentions. Therefore, the human is not only a passive receiver of love, he is not only the object of love, but at the same time, the medium of the pledge of love for others. The acting of the human as surrogate and the acting of God acts of freedom are two signs of one coin and sh should not be understood by means of competition. The believer is a servant of God because he is a medium for God's intentions. God is mainly acting in our world through human beings. And for this reason, we can say in a certain way, God needs humans to realize his intentions of love and mercy. But God's dependency on mankind is not a sign of weakness. God is not depending on mankind in an ontological way. He decided freely for this kind of interacting with the world. Muhammad, the prophet, tells uh, the following story. Uh, ver uh, verily, God, the exalted and glorious, would say on the day of resurrection, O son of Adam, I was sick, but you didn't visit me. Who would say, he would say, O my Lord, how could I visit you, whereas you are the Lord of the world? God would say, didn't you know that such and such servant of mine was sick, but you didn't visit him? And were you not aware of this, that if you had visited him, you would have found me by him? O son of Adam, I asked food from you, but you didn't feed me. O son of Adam, I asked drink from you, uh, but you didn't provide me, and so on and so on. And every time he says, um, if you uh, uh, ha had you... Uh, 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 do this and that, you would have found me by him. A very similar story can be found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, with the famous finish, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God is present when a human needs him. Every human testimony of merciful love to a fellow creator is an answer to God's love. 
Spirituality enables a human being to see God's merciful face in the face of every human being and to serve God by serving every uh, uh, fellow creature. Every simple act of mercy is a manifestation of God. Where mercy is, there is God. A mother embracing her, uh, her child, a smile, a sign of goodness, love and mercy, all of them reveal God's mercy and call for the experiencing of God. In every act of mercy, finally, God is present. Ladies and gentlemen, you already realize that this God-man understanding is also political. Religiosity is not realized only in the belief in God or in the performance of religious rituals, such as praying or fasting. Religiosity means acting. It means working on one's character. It means being as much as possible the hand of love. But religiosity as an action to realize God's intentions has the risk of legitima uh, legitimizing anti-human action, referring to God in the process. What criteria can help us identify whether an action is in God's intention or not? What opportunities, but also what challenges are hidden in open theology? I am very excited by the presentations and the discussions today and tomorrow. And I would like now to pass the word to my uh, colleague, Manuel. Please, Manuel. Thank you, Muhannad, very much. And also, uh, thank you, Tom, for your introductory words. Um, I'm also very excited that this conference can take place today and tomorrow. And I, I am, um, honestly, I really have the expectation that the, the presentations and the responses, as well as the discussions among us, will inspire us and show us a, a common way forward. And lest I forget, I want to, to thank Asena Aivas uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, she works uh, uh, for the Center of Islamic Theology in Münster. And I want to thank you, Asena, for your outstanding work in preparing the conference. Without you, this uh, event would not have been possible. Thanks uh, for everything you, you did in preparation of, of today. Um, Yes, in a, in a way, the, the history of this conference goes back many years because uh, about six years ago, I met Professor Muhannad Koshid in San Antonio at the annual meeting of uh, the American Academy of Religion. And I hadn't known you, Muhannad, at all until then. And uh, because you were there with a Catholic colleague, I didn't even realize that uh, you were an Islamic scholar. Um, we, we talked there about God and history and about God's actions and his nature and about man's freedom and responsibility and, and, and much more. Um, and at some point, of course, I finally realized that Muhammad Korshid comes from a different religious tradition than I do. Um, but I, I, I gained the impression at that time and and it also struck me again in sub subsequent encounters with muhana korshid and 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 then also with uh, with uh, with um, other uh, islamic scholars um that i often feel closer to his faith and convictions than to the theology of many christians i know or i hear of and I do not mean to brush over the differences and special characteristics of Christianity and Islam, but I quickly realized that uh, that Muhammad Korshid and many other Islamic scholars, uh, some of them are here today. I'm I'm very glad to see you, uh, Muna Tatari and uh, uh, Saeed Amir Sadri. We 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 met at, at conferences in the last years, and it's awesome to see you to see you here. Um, uh, I realized that that um, also Islamic scholars think in, in in this open and relational paradigm that had also become so important to me. And in the years that followed, um, me and Muhannad met again. And for the last four years, I have been working with Muhannad Korshid at the University of Münster. 
on a research project on relational theology. And during this time, the idea for this conference emerged. And uh, like Tom said, the conference seeks to ex explore the social and political implications of an open and relational theology in both uh, religious traditions. And um, when uh, we asked Tom Ort and uh, within the, the Center of Open and Relational Theology, if they are in on it, uh, Tom immediately agreed. And of course, Tom, without your ideas and your widespread network and your experience, uh, also with online conferences, we wouldn't be joining here. Thank you for that. Let me just add that the urgency for this conference, I think, has only increased in the last two years. The corona pandemic, Russia's war in the Ukraine and the ever worsening climate crisis make it unmistakably clear that we cannot continue on this individual, individualistic and capitalist chorus. And the question arises, are there realistic alternatives to it? Is there, is there another story we can tell and another story we can step into? And I am convinced that a, a relational theology, theological approach points the way to that. So that much uh, from my side. Now it's a special privilege uh, for me that none other than John Cobb will be kicking off this conference. John, uh, along with uh, uh, David Ray Griffin, is undoubtedly the most important pioneer of process theology. And uh, he is still more alive and active at 97 years than many other people ever are in a lifetime. Uh, that is also the reason why he can't be here in person today. As far as I know, he's in Asia at a climate conference, but he has recorded a video for us uh, dressed in a traditional Chinese festive suit because uh, he was in China at the time of the recording. So this man um, comes around a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if Tom is ready to start the video, the Honorable John Cup with a wonder wonderful input at the beginning of this conference. Greetings to all of you. I particularly regret that previous commitments prevent my participation in this, this event. I feel strongly that people of the book have so much in common and yet do not often work together. Process thinking has been marginal in Christianity, but I had feared that it would be even more marginal in Islam. Now I have been assured that the same possibilities exist there. In Christianity, we have the advantage that the Hebrews, who produced most of our scriptures, very, very closely with Dave, are in process uh, too. Events and stories are looked to for truth and guidance, rather than substantial objects and their characteristics. I think the same is true for the Quran. I think for both what has happened in history shapes our understanding of what we are now called to do in our unique historical situation. Cultures that seek to find the meaning of life through past and present events have rarely attempted to systematize their metaphysics. This puts them at a disadvantage with thinkers and cultures that encourage such systematization. Greeks and Romans asked questions about Christian thought to which the Bible had no answers. Indeed, from a process perspective, they are the wrong questions. But because the Christians had not developed an explanation of why they were wrong, their official teaching took the form of creeds formulated in terms of substances. <clears throat> the idea that Christian faith is a matter of belief in creeds and the profoundly unbiblical affirmations the creeds convey have alienated us from other people of the book. 
and even alienated Christians from their own book. I hope that working with Muslims, who are, I think, more fully tied to the book, will help us. I'm quite sure that Christian process theology is more congenial to the Bible than are the substance philosophies that have dominated our theologies. Would that Christians in the Roman Empire had been ready to critique the dominant philosophical ideas from a more Hebraic perspective. But even now, it is worth doing. In fact, as the dominance of substance thought with its inability to understand the centrality of re central reality of relations is leading humanity to self-destruction, there has never been a greater need to recover the historically formed and oriented thinking associated with the book. In the book, there is no question about the importance of relations, physically, mentally, metaphysically, spiritually, and historically. There is no question that relations of cooperation are and must be more fundamental than relations of competition that so often end up in war. We people of the book have much of which to repent. Fortunately, we have never denied that. Thankfully, we worship a merciful God. Our salvation is God's gift, not our achievement. But none of us suppose that simply admitting our failures and rejoicing in God is enough. We are called to serve God in all dimensions, but most clearly in history. Ever, even with the best intentions, we may make mistakes and misinterpret what we are called to do. Despite our knowledge of the evils of idolatry, we absolutize ideas and loyalties that are less than God and less than the whole of God's creation. Perhaps we Christians have been the worst in this respect. We have absolutized our creeds in ways that have led us to see our fellow peoples of books as evils to be destroyed. At least in this respect, Islam has been far better. In any case, if we Christians and Muslims work together, we may help each other to avoid idolatry. I think process thought can help. There is increasing recognition that the human future is profoundly threatened by our continuing destruction of its natural base and our continuing favoring of violent competition. <laughs> our loving, over-loving cooperation. Let us examine ourselves carefully and repent for all that we do to support these global failures. But let us shout from the rooftops that God has shown us a better way, a way that even now could make a huge difference. May this conference move us forward into uncharted waters. The changes that must occur are dangerous. They are not simple and comfortable but they would give our grandchildren a chance. That is worth our paying some price. So may it be. That's a beautiful, beautiful set of words and ideas from a 97 year old man. <laughs> I think we could forgive him for not taking the phone off the hook. I, I started to go try to find my phone once I saw that ringing, but that that's a beautiful way to start the conference. Um, in a moment, I'm going to tell you, talk to you briefly about who is going to be presenting and responding in today's set of lectures and discussions. Uh, before I do that, however, I, there are two sort of technical issues that I think I want to make sure you know about. First of all, 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, m about 150 people have signed up to be a part of this, and it looks like we're about at 70 right now currently uh, participating in this conference. Um, there's just no way that 70 people can unmute and ask questions during our discussion, but we do want your participation. And so I'm asking that if you have a question for our presenters, our respondents, or just a general question or statement, if you would paste that in the chat box there at the bottom of the screen, I will be monitoring that. And during the discussion time, I'll pick out the questions or comments that seem especially relevant, and those will help us in our discussion. Secondly, um, we are recording each of the sessions and the respondents, and a week or so after the conference, after uh, my assistant Josh Gilbert has a chance to do some uh, technical work, we'll be providing those uh, lectures as video and audio recordings. So you don't have to be here for absolutely every minute of the conference to get everything good from the conference. You can go back and access those videos or the audio for a podcast and uh, get the goodness that comes from this particular conference. Having said that, today's lineup of speakers and respondents include Jared Morningstar, Jay McDaniel, Gregory Boyd, Aaron Langenfeld, Saidra Mirsadri, and Michael Lodal. And then we'll conclude the day with a little bit of discussion from Mohanad and Manuel and myself again. But that's our plan. After the first uh, lecture from Jared Morningstar and Jay McDaniel, we'll take a short break and then we'll uh, resume again with Gregory Boyd's lecture. If you have questions, and not only about the topics and what uh, the lectures talk about, but about the conference, you can also uh, add those to the chat box there at the bottom of the screen. It seems appropriate to have a greeting from John Cobb, a legendary theologian, process theologian at 97 years old. And then after he greets us and welcomes us to this conversation, to then turn to Jared Morningstar, who's much, much younger, uh, an Islamic scholar, to give our first lecture to be responded to uh, by Jay McDaniel. Jared, are you uh, ready to begin your lecture? Yes, sir. Excellent. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All right, welcome. Uh, thank you all for, for having me. It's quite an honor to be presenting alongside uh, scholars, much my senior. Uh, certainly, uh, John Cobb is a lifetime uh, ahead of me. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to begin by looking at the question of how open and relational theology can help at this uh, sort of really high-level uh, engagement of Islam and modernity, uh, as a lot of these social, political, climate crisis uh, sorts of uh, issues that we face are really tied in with this uh, idea of modernity that uh, Muslims have been grappling with now for quite some time. Um, but uh, there's there's still quite a bit uh, of of work to do. So uh, I'm kind of going at the the deep theoretical level, uh, looking at this uh, uh, modernity as sort of this meta issue uh, that uh, is Islamic thinkers face uh, in in trying to unpack some of these social political uh, issues. Uh, as uh, a lot of the the ways that uh, modernity has been theorized and approached by uh, Islamic thinkers uh, historically has has left something to be desired um, in terms of forming a really creative and uh, dynamic synthesis and uh, offering really uh, responsive and innovative uh, uh, forms of uh, forms of life, uh, forms of Islamic uh, thinking and religiosity that are are well suited to uh, to the contemporary context. So I think open and relational process uh, type uh, thinking uh, offers some some interesting possibilities in in that regard. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to unpack a little bit about what those uh, what those potentialities might be in this presentation. So historically, uh, there have been a number of different uh, 
Muslim responses to modernity. One typology that I found uh, pretty helpful is something that uh, Joseph Lombard and others have developed in their volume, Islam, Fundamentalism, and the Betrayal of Tradition, where they present a basic threefold uh, typology of Islamic responses to modernity with uh, the puritanical reformists, uh, the modernists, and the traditionalists being the three groups that they single out. Uh, here's a couple examples of who might fit in each of these camps, but uh, there could be many other uh, thinkers and uh, scholar activists that uh, could be included in any of these. Um, and uh, Lombard and his uh, colleagues in that volume uh, really promote traditionalism uh, as sort of the uh, most most uh, thorough, most uh, robust uh, response to the, the issues that modernity raises. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of value in in the work they do in that regard, uh, and I think uh, there's there's a lot they're onto in terms of reviving the the resources within classical Islam that uh, uh, are, are going to be very pertinent uh, moving forward and trying to uh, grapple with with these historical developments from a uniquely Islamic standpoint, maintaining that continuity, um, but uh, also uh, uh, being flexible, being dynamic. Uh, however, I think there's some uh, some issues uh, within the the traditionalist fame framework that uh, make it uh, uh, in in uh, insufficient for for this task. Uh, I think there's more tension and uh, less homogeneity within this uh, this camp than uh, Lombard and some of his fellow traditionalists may let on. Uh, even in classical Islam, before the, the puritanical reformist types uh, really uh, developed their own uh, style of thinking, uh, you still have uh, much more literalist and rigid, stringent uh, types of, of thinking, say, for example, within the, the Hanbali uh, school of fiqh, uh, or, and compare that with the sort of Akbarian style Sufism that Lombard uh, and uh, his fellow traditionalists really uh, take as the most normative Islamic framework, these are very different. Uh, and so how can you reconcile that? Uh, where are the mechanisms for sort of internal differentiation and critique? Uh, I think those are open questions uh, for these, these scholars. Instead of looking at <clears throat> uh, traditionalism as uh, sort of free from some of the, the pathologies that uh, are identified in these other responses to modernity, I think all of these uh, camps are sort of equally caught in an issue of what I'm going to be calling repetition. So they try to take some material, uh, whether it be uh, sort of uh, classical legal thinking or uh, in the case of the traditionalists uh, or very scriptural understandings in the case of the puritanical reformists or uh, much more sort of contemporary Western uh, philosophies in the case of uh, the modernists. Either way, they're kind of all uh, bringing this material in and trying to uh, take that as the the standpoint or the basis, the the framework for an Islamic uh, response to modernity. But they they don't have great mechanisms for for critiquing their own methodologies for allowing uh, sort of. Uh, novelty or adaptation to to come in at the the sort of ground level of their their sort of epistemologies and uh, philosophical presuppositions and and the like. So as a result, uh, you have this uh, this problem of trying to to fit something that was perhaps very uh, useful in a, a particular historical context, but trying to uh, just faithfully reproduce it in the contemporary times can lead to, to difficulties as the context is not uh, quite the same. Here's a, a quote from Whitehead that I think helps uh, show the, the issue with, with this type of uh, paradigm. Whitehead in Process and Reality writes in the, the final part of his magnum opus, Order is not sufficient. What is required is something much more complex. It is order entering upon novelty so that the massiveness of order does not denigrate into a mere repetition. And so that the novelty is always reflected 
upon the background of the system. So Whitehead's really helpful here in uh, showing the sort of metaphysical, ontological necessity of both novelty and order, and that uh, there, there can be sort of issues, pathologies uh, with uh, not striking the proper balance between these, these two uh, facts of life. Um, and so being stuck in the paradigm of repetition, uh, you end up with some tyrannical and, and rigid orders that uh, perhaps don't well serve the contemporary issues. So here's kind of a, a visualization of uh, this, this paradigm of, of repetition. So you have the classic Islamic uh, epistemology values of uh, traditionalism. And while these are sort of offering critiques of Islamic modernism and of the puritanical reformists as well, and there's uh, some real substance to those critiques, uh, they aren't admitting uh, sort of critical uh, ideas, uh, uh, ideas for uh, reform into their own sort of uh, epistemological structures. Uh, and uh, certainly modernism and uh, the reformism both have have some uh, some interesting ideas that might be well worth considering uh, for sort of altering that that base of the uh, that framework of, of classical Islam. So uh, in terms of repetition, the methodological repetition of the traditionalists and the scriptural literalist uh, repetition of the puritanical reformist are like dead organisms, no longer able to bring sustenance into their internal constitution, cut off from reciprocal relationship with the environment that is the basis of ecological existence. So neither of these responses are really allowing for uh, an organic flow, uh, an internal development. Uh, they are only trying to respond to novelty. They're taking novelty as a, as a problem to be dealt with, uh, rather than uh, something that uh, uh, spurs transformation as well uh, and necessitates it. The repetition of the Islamic modernist, who often simply repeats the forms of Western modernity in Islamic idiom, fares no better as they lack the deep connection with tradition that would allow for the novelty of modernity to be reflected upon the background of the system, as Whitehead wrote which is in turn what would allow for genuine discernment in deciding how to incorporate this material. So again, uh, you have scholars who are trying to sort of naively uh, reproduce a, a form of, of Western European modern uh, thinking values within an Islamic context. Um, but uh, if you read back at the early Islamic modernists today, uh, one is is really struck by how how little there is criticism uh, in terms of sort of the ecological uh, uh, failings of of a modernist perspective and a, a traditional Islamic uh, viewpoint may may well present uh, some some real uh, alternatives in that regard. Uh, so lacking this uh, ability to discern how to uh, critique and incorporate the uh, sort of methodological framework that's being used uh, leads to leads to some uh, really unfortunate consequences as context shift. So process, uh, I think, offers a, a very helpful alternative here uh, as a as a framework for uh, being critical in both ways, allowing that reciprocal uh, sort of critique to to happen and allow for transformation. Uh, in the in the basic structures, while not being sort of closed off or um, too too willing to uh, simply replace uh, something that uh, obviously has some important insights that may be well worth incorporating. So, within the process, theological and philosophical traditions, there are uh, both sort of critical elements that uh, really push back against ideas from modernity and inherited religion, both. But at the same time, neither of these things are sort of crudely dismissed and both are taken to have very important insights for particular domains of life and uh, that these ought to be uh, integrated in, in a healthful manner. Uh, so uh, develop further developing an Islamic uh, process perspective, I think could help with uh, 
keeping a deep continuity with the the forms of uh, Islamic thought that have come before, and really pulling out those uh, those uh, uh, the, the 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 insights that that are applicable to our time, while not dismissing uh, some of the the modern uh, ideals that ought to be integrated as well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Jared. That was excellent. What a great start. Really appreciate that. Uh, I made an error right off the bat in this conference. I forgot to have you, Jared, uh, introduce yourself by giving us a sentence or two, uh, telling us who you were. But in this particular case, because Jay is following you uh, and because Jay sent me some private messages saying he wanted to talk about you, <laughs> I think I'm just going to let him uh, introduce you with a few sentences, introduce himself, and then, you know, whatever mistakes he makes, you can come through <laughs> and clean them up later if that's okay. Sounds so, perfect. Uh, great. <laughs> Jay McDaniel, a response to Jared Morningstar. Well, I'm so happy to do that. Jared, could you remind us just of your titles? I know you as a person, but could you say a word about your titles? Yeah, so at the Cobb Institute, I am uh, operations assistant and at the Center for Process Studies, I am social media manager. Um, the day-to-day uh, -day of, of my jobs are not fully uh, encapsulated by, by those responsibilities, but. <laughs> and, and, and Jared, you majored in Islamic studies um, in college, is that correct? I have a degree in religion with emphasis on uh, Islamic studies, uh, yes, as, a, as an undergrad and also a Scandinavian studies degree. <laughs> uh, and, and I just want to say to everybody, Jared's pretty amazing, and I have the good fortune of being able to visit with him a lot. Um, and there's so much to learn from him. He's remarkable. If John is 97, and I won't ask uh, Jared how old you are, but you're so much younger and so much uh Fresh possibility ahead of you. Uh, my name is Jay McDaniel, and I'm the chair of the board of directors of an organization called the Cobb Institute for Process and Practice. And so I work very closely with John Cobb, uh, again, on a regular basis, and our institute, named after him, is particularly interested in the application of process thought um, to real problems uh, in a troubled world. And I'll say more about that shortly. I'm also on the leadership team of a multi-faith organization called Process and Faith. And the uh, director of that is also with us today. Her name is Sherry Kling. Uh, Sherry, if you'd wave at us, she's the director. But I'm on the leadership team. And it is multi-faith. It's not Christian alone. We talk about actually 17 religious paths. Uh, one of which is Christianity, one of which is Islam, one of which is Judaism, one of which is Taoism, one of which is Buddhism, uh, one of which is Hinduism, etc. So we're actually interested in how a process perspective might be available and, and creatively appropriated by uh, people of, of many paths. Now, just a little bit more about me I also taught Islam as a college teacher, and I taught Sayyid Nasser. And the, the, so I taught traditionalism, but I also taught Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, I taught someone who's talking about um, progressivism. So I'm fairly familiar with Iqbal's perspective and Sayyid Nasser's version of traditionalism, and I find wisdom in them both. Uh, I'm with Jared and critique within both. But what I'd like to do in the remainder of my time with you is to straightforwardly address the issue we're trying to address in this conference, namely the social and political implications of an open relational perspective and or a process perspective. I consider process a kind of open and relational thinking. So it's a subset of the open and relational world and there are many other versions that are excellent but I'm, I'm about process. We at the Process Institute talk about four needs in the world today, four aspirational ideals, four things people rightly hope for and strive toward. Uh, the first uh, is simply becoming a whole person. 
a whole person filled with wisdom and compassion and joy and creativity and humility and gratitude. So that's the hope for individual wholeness. And of course, Islam and Christianity take that very seriously. Um, the second hope is for what we call whole communities. And these are communities that are creative and compassionate and participatory and inclusive and humane to animals and good for the earth with no one left behind, with no one left behind. And those communities can be towns, villages, cities, neighborhoods. Ideally, you could even, even have a nation committed to that kind of community. We call them just and compassionate communities. The third hope is for a whole planet. And the, uh, the um, global climate change is an obvious instance that of a transnational problem that affects everybody in many forms of life. So, by the way, does the threat of nuclear war. So, that, by the way, does war itself. Um, so, it's not enough to think in terms of local community or even nationalistically. We must also think holistically of planetary well-being. In the aspirational ideal of many forms of life, flourishing on a small but beautiful planet, now in so much trouble. So whole persons, whole community, whole planet. And the fourth aspirational ideal is for holistic thinking. Ways of thinking that lend themselves to respect and care for life. They need to take science seriously. They need to take spirituality seriously. They need to take aesthetic experience seriously. They need to be a kind of philosophy or theology that has a wide mind, a wide perspective. Now, we in the process world think Whitehead's philosophy uh, does a good job of that. It's profoundly holistic. But we know it's not the only one. And we celebrate when there are other philosophies, other perspectives that also illuminate the relational character of existence and lend themselves to respect and care for the community of life. So that's where the process community is today in terms of aspirational ideals. And what we're interested in is in the practical application of those ideals in local settings. And we're doing very practical things along those lines. But aspirational ideals are not the whole of it. So I want to mention uh, five worldview ideas that shape us and that in a way build upon what Jared said. When we think of a process worldview, uh, one thing we think about is simply the idea of interbecoming. Things become together. They come in relationship to one another. Becoming is never isolated. It's also in and out of relationality. And by the way, interbecoming can be positive or negative or somewhere in between. Violence is a form of interbecoming. So is peace. In each instance, you have interbecoming. That's the way the world works. The second idea that we want to lift up is the intrinsic value of life. And that's to say, wherever there is a creature of any sort that struggles to live with satisfaction relative to the circumstances of, of life, that creature deserves some kind of respect. And that's respect for life, not human life alone, as much life as we can. Now, there are all kinds of issues that emerge there, and I'm glad to talk about that, but that notion of the intrinsic value of life is essential to a process perspective. The third idea is that we live in a purposive universe. Um, it's, it's possible to think of the universe as devoid of purpose. It's simply a collection of interbecomings, uh, not for process thinkers. The universe contains within it ideals of truth and goodness, and beauty. And beauty is very important in process thought. That's what drew me to Nasser's thought in the traditionalists. They took beauty seriously. Let that be. 
The fourth idea is creativity. Jared spoke to that, so I'm not going to say anything more. It's just that we believe that the universe contains within itself, part of its makeup is, is novelty, newness. Uh, it's actually part of the essence of the universe. And we see creativity all the way down. And the last idea I'll mention here, and then I'm going to say a word about God, um, is we're committed to um, thinking of ourselves as part of an earth community. And so when you hear the word community, it's, it's kind of easy to think of human beings and them alone gathered into some kind of relationship. But we actually live within a larger community, the earth community. So we want to affirm that. Uh, we're very attracted to aspects of Islam. Um, and this was, a, this was actually a theme in, in Muhammad Iqbal, uh, where he talks about the whole earth as a mosque. It's a, it's a great idea. A Christian might say the whole world, earth is a sanctuary. It doesn't, you know, whatever word, there, there's something about the wholeness, and we live in that the larger web of life. So I've mentioned four aspirational ideals and five ideas important to the process worldview. Uh, you notice that I didn't mention God, but here it comes. <laughs> um, in my view, people can embrace every idea I just said, and they can have their doubts about God, or that cannot be important to them. So we work a lot with people in Asia, Chinese, and for right, rightly or wrongly, the concept of God is not where they are. So we believe there's much to celebrate about relationality, even apart from the question of God. However, most process thinkers really do um, place their trust in a loving presence. To use the language of John Sanders, a nurturing presence that's on the side of life and on the side of the well-being of life. Now, for us in the process community, and I think in the open and relational community, I'm, I'm, I know in the open and relational community, love, nurturance, has two sides. On the one hand, it's how God is active in the world. In powerful, but not all powerful ways. In powerful, but not one-sided ways. So we talk about the luring power of God everywhere, certainly in human life. The other is God as a companion, as a, as a reality that shares in the sufferings and the joys of all living beings, and humans much included, and is affected by them. So that doesn't give you the image of a fixed, authoritarian, changeless mm -hmm. God. It, it gives you the image of um, a God of love, mm -hmm. a, a God who receives and is affected by and always at work. Mm -hmm. Now, is that way of thinking about God available in Islam? Well, I'm, I'm somewhat aware of um, Tawheed and Takla. Forgive me if I, say, if I say the words wrong, but the notion of the distance of God and also the notion of the intimacy of God, the incomparability of God, but also the notion of the closeness of God, closer than our jugular veins. Hmm. And it seems to me that that invites an emphasis on mercy, on compassion, on love, even as it invites honest respect for the mystery, mm, excellent. the uninframability of the divine life. Uh, we in, in the process world want to affirm both of those. So um, Jared starts us off with novelty. And I end up with God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jay. There we are. Blessings to everybody. That was beautiful. That's a beautiful response. Thank you so much. 
Now we're going to move to our discussion. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm inviting you all, if you have questions, comments, to put them in the chat box and then I'll uh, vet them. Uh, we have one from Connie about feminist and mystical dimensions of Islam, Jared. Why don't you, uh, why don't you respond to that one? Are there some, some uh, mystical or feminist dimensions that are reflected in modern Islam? Yeah, the the modernists. Um, I would hesitate to fully label them as as feminist, but uh, they they did in general have a, a sense of looking to to reform some of the Islamic customs and and thinking around uh, gender differences. Uh, but uh, this is also a, a movement that began in the uh, 19th century. Um, so what uh, was sort of uh, progressive around uh, gender roles at that time uh, is, is very different uh, than uh, what we sure. are thinking of in the 21st century. In terms of mystical dimensions, uh, broadly, the Islamic modernists were critical of Sufism, uh, the sort of Islamic mystical tradition uh, within uh, Sunni Islam, uh, thinking that it uh, uh, had become a bit too focused on sort of immaterial forms of, of spirituality disconnected from uh, from the problems of the day um, and, and too focused on sort of private uh, or sort of communal uh, transcendent experience. Uh, to the to the neglect of some of the sort of ethical dimensions of of life uh, mm. so there's some interesting critiques there uh in general it seems like the islamic modernists may have been a little harsh on on the sufi traditions and uh i would think that a, a process approach would uh try to to integrate those a bit more thoroughly uh into Excellent. into an outlook yeah, very good. Thanks, Jared. Jay, um, Andre asks, uh, brings in another conversation partner. Actually, he thinks that maybe a lot of what you were talking about sounds like Celtic spirituality. Um, can you make a, a comment on, on that, Jay? Uh, I think you're muted. In historical Christianity, there are many, many strands. Um, and so some people say we should talk about Christianities in the plural, not Christianity in the singular. I don't go along with that, but I do think there are multiple strands. And one of them is the Celtic strand. And it certainly had an emphasis on ecology and the living quality of, of everything uh, that resonates with a process perspective. Um, there we are. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Jay. Charles uh, has a question for you, Jared, I think. Uh, I think it's aimed at you. And it's a tiff. I think of it as a difficult one. I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. What, what do you think is more fundamental to uh, traditionalism, Islamic traditionalism? Do you think it's timeless truths, things passed on, that that's more fundamental? Or basic practices uh, that obviously there's intertwining. It's hard to separate mm -hmm. those two. But if if you had to choose, which you think is more fundamental in traditional Islam? Yeah, in terms of the traditionalists in general, um, I would say that uh, maintaining the practices uh, is probably uh, ranks a bit higher um, than sort of the the dogmatic concerns, uh, but considering traditionalism as a response to modernity, it is going to be pretty cerebral, um, and they are going to be trying to really pull uh, from the the whole gamut of Islamic intellectual history, from the philosophers to the legal theorists to the the Sufi mystics. Uh, so, in that sense, there's there's definitely a a strong kind of normative. Uh, dogmatic or perhaps not dogmatic, but theological uh, component to it. But in terms of uh, uh, sort of average people who would perhaps best be placed in in the context of traditional Islam, uh, they're probably going to be a bit more uh, focused on uh, maintaining the community bonds, the practices, um, even as a uh, there are certain theological commitments that they would maintain as well, but uh, those are minimal and a somewhat more pluralistic, uh, a more pluralistic approach to, to orthodoxy, at least in terms of selecting from uh, uh, recognized viewpoints uh, among the theological schools. Great. All right. Another difficult question. This time I'm aiming at both of you, Jay and Jared. We'll start with you, Jay. 
if what Jared's one of his main points, or maybe his main point, is that there's something about this order and novelty mm-hmm, that somehow mm-hmm. together that that we have to we can't swing too far one way or the other. So my question is, um, what issues, topics, concerns, controversies in that you see in Islam? Uh, that do you think are most intractable at the moment, most most difficult to overcome, and maybe what uh, topic or issue you see progress being made in terms of maintaining something positive from the past, but also open to novelty uh, in the present? Uh, thoughts on on that kind of question? It- you want me to go first, Tom? <laughs> if Jared wants to go first, he just talked. So I was going to. I've got a thought. I, I do have a thought, but I have a feeling Jared's thought is a lot better than mine. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take it first, and uh, Jay, if you have anything to add, I'll pass it back to you. Um, I think there's there's two issues that uh, come to mind uh, in in this regard for me. Um, one is the uh, classical legal tradition and uh, the sort of principles of this tradition um, and sort of the the, the structure of, of how it functions uh, within the Islamic intellectual framework. Uh, so you have a, a very uh, sort of legalistically oriented uh, tradition um, that has for a decent amount of time now been uh, pretty entrenched in uh, commentaries on commentaries, focusing on uh, really uh, specific issues. And uh, there's generally been sort of an absence of a more holistic framework for Thinking about uh, what is the aim of of uh, of uh, sort of the Islamic legal uh, mm-hmm. uh, thinking in in human life uh, nowadays, you do have a bit more uh, attention on this idea of makasid on Sharia, the sort of uh, aims of of the Sharia. What is it seeking to promote in human life beyond just this sort of rote obedience to what is seen as as God's law uh, for for its own sake? Uh, there are some dangers to uh, shifting to uh, quickly and uh, carelessly to this kind of uh, framework of aims. Uh, it, it can it can have some downsides, uh, but uh, I think uh, currently we're uh, struggling to have have good rationalizations for Islamic law uh, and how, how it promotes human life. Uh, the other thing I will briefly mention is uh, I think the place and function of the Hadith literature um, mm. is uh, is a complicated issue right now. Um, certainly, the puritanical reformists, especially, hold this in very high regard um, and treat it uh, uh, almost on on the same footing as as the Quran um, mm-hmm. in terms of being this uh, uh, material that one wishes to to replicate uh, uh, very faithfully in in contemporary contexts. Um, so rethinking a uh, sort of the the place of the hadith literature and its its function and uh, trying to to think more holistically about Islamic law, I think would be my my two two main. Those are great. Yeah, those are great examples. Jay, you want to add something to that? Or well, I, I think I think in Islam, uh, I agree with Jared. Is from my perspective, um, attitudes toward law um, and hadith uh, are very important. I would add to that understanding of scripture, Uh, the the status of the Quran, the status of of the New Testament, the status of Torah for for Christians and Jews. And those two traditions, Islam and Christianity, have really been in different places on that. So the historical critical critique of, of, of documents in the New Testament, that's almost commonplace among liberal Protestants. Uh, It's not as commonplace among others. But that's a pretty hard thing to sell to any Islamic context. And so I myself have, have, but it's also a hard thing to sell to Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews. And Orthodox Judaism has managed to build within it terribly creative ways of appropriating Torah, given the view that it's God's word. I have a feeling some of those possibilities for creative interpretation are also available in Islam, working with the notion that the Quran is the word of God 
pure and simple, rather than adding so much relativization, so much critique. And I do think that the notion of novelty can play a role here. Um, interpreting an infallible text in novel ways relative to context and the role of imagination. So I have hope there. I'd like to say one more, though, that I myself have, I think Christianity and Islam both face serious challenges on multiple fronts. And so Jared's paper for me, he was really pointing toward an attitude, mm. an attitude that we can take where we expect novelty. It, it becomes part of what we come to expect rather than an exception. It's something we expect. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, last word for me here. Uh, Sayyid Nasser, the traditional, that traditionalist, very, very influenced by Neoplatonic ways of understanding God and the notion of the timelessness of God, extremely important to him. Um, but he does great things with it. I mean, you know, he does some very good things with it. So I think we, sh I myself, as a process theologian, am open to non-process ways of understanding of God. Mm when they lend themselves to love mm. and sustainability. I, I'm not going to argue with people. <laughs> I, th I, I think you can have nine of those 10 ideas I shared, and we can disagree on the 10th, which concerns God. Um, <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned scripture, and that's where our next question is going to go. Um, and But before I, I ask the question, um, I, I think most of us realize that um, I'll say the typical Christian and the typical Muslim uh, probably think that the other religion is way off, wrong. You know, the scriptures are can't nothing in, mm. can be true in both of them. I, I recently came across a meme that made me laugh. I'm going to share my screen quickly here so you can see this. Hopefully, look, you're going to hell. Omg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is, what, since this is supposed to be a conversation about big issues between Muslims and Christians, are there themes in the Bible, in the Quran, are there themes that can unite Christians and Muslims together in facing these challenges that both of you have articulated? So when you, I know Jay, you come from a Christian background, still consider yourself a Christian, although you obviously are well uh, versed in other traditions, including Islam. Jared, I, you come from an Islamic background, but I assume you know something about the um, the Christian Bible. What themes in those two books do you think can be helpful to make progress together? Jared, why don't you start? Yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, the Islamic tradition has has a lot uh, in this regard. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, in fact, the the sort of orientation of the puritanical reformist that is deeply scripturalist and says, uh, oh, "Let's wipe away some of this uh, really complex uh, intellectual frameworks that built up in the classical tradition." Back to the text. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's something to be gained there. Uh, if one goes to the Quran uh, with uh, with uh, sort of open ears, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, in this document, God is is very sort of uh, uh, interreligious in in some deep way, uh, speaking of the the Christians and the Jews as important people of the book um, who. Uh, perhaps have some issues with their religions, uh, who doesn't, uh, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, they are sort of companions to the, the emerging Islamic community and uh, uh, obviously maintain a, a faithful connection to one and the same Abrahamic God. Uh, so uh, some, in some ways, the the uh, traditional uh, classical Islamic uh, approach uh, has used this method of abrogation of saying, mm -hmm. oh, this uh, this earlier piece of scripture was sort of qualified or canceled out by uh, something they take as, as later revealed or in somehow more authoritative to really kind of uh, dampen some of those more pluralistic, uh, uh, almost quasi perennialist uh, types of statements. Um, 
But uh, I mean, on the other hand, within traditional Islam, you have uh, people like uh, Rumi and uh, other Sufi uh, mystics who uh, seem very sort of uh, open to uh, the possibility of uh, uh, God appearing in uh, many different forms to uh, those outside of Islam and uh, even even perhaps uh, idolaters uh, in a sense. That's excellent. Yeah. Jared, I'm conscious of the time and uh, Jay. I'm not going to be fair to you. We have 30 seconds for you <laughs> to say something, and then we're going to take a break. <laughs> so I'm sorry to be in this situation, but in 30 seconds, can you answer my question? <laughs> well, I think I think you just took seven of them. <laughs> <laughs> I surely did. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll lift up two ideas. I, th- I think in, in Christianity, the notion of the image of God okay. within each person is a helpful idea. As a con, you know, if you take that little cartoon you showed, oh my gosh, you're yeah. going to hell too. Uh, I think you could add, add another question. And by the way, is everyone made in the image of God? Mm, nice. and, and I think a, a, a Christian would have a hard time saying no to that. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and it really can't do it. Um, and I think in Islam, there's the notion, there's the notion of God as um, um well, we're all Muslims. <laughs> mm. We all carry within us a, a, a a sense of God's reality. Hmm. We all want to, to surrender to it. We may not know that. We may cover it over, but it's part of everybody, not just Muslims. There Excellent. you go. All right. You did great. Sorry, Jay. <laughs>